Dear friends and colleagues, I am really delighted to start a very interesting panel dedicated to personalized medicine. And I am proud that I have uh, uh, lecturers really from all around the world. We have Professor Shin from Korea, Tony uh, from Europe, and Daryl from the United States. So uh, half of the world is here, so to say. And um, let me say just a few words about the protocol. We will hear uh, two panelists without presentation. There will be a presentation from Professor Shin with slides. Unfortunately, the zeitgeist, uh, the COVID has taken its toll. Our fourth speaker, Professor Dudo from Bulgaria, is, is ill and cannot, cannot join, but we will uh, present his pre recorded session. After that, there will be time for questions and for comments from the audience. So now I am happy to start with Tony. Tony Antoni is uh, the scientific director of one of the largest European research infrastructures called Theatris, dedicated as well to personalized medicine. And um, Tony is a medical doctor, uh, but he is also expert in genetics. And uh, I hope he will deliver an interesting speech now regarding the current perspectives of personalized medicine. Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dimitar. Well, first of all, I have to say that I'm very happy to be with the community of the Biotech Atelier. I attended your, the meeting last year, and I think there is this flavor of enthusiasm, of an energy of this global and multidisciplinary community, which is exactly the thing that we need for progressing to the future. So, um, Eatris, maybe could be interesting just mention for the audience a couple of uh, elements about Eatris. We are, as Dimitar mentioned, an uh, uh, international organization. There are 13 European countries that belong to Eatris. Bulgaria is one of them. Bulgaria joined last year Eatris. And in our network, there are more than 120 research institutions that work in the field of translational medicine. So from uh, research centers, universities to clinical in hospitals and clinical research uh, institutions. So personalized medicine has been over the last couple of years, uh, the backbone of our own, our, our own identity because we strongly believe that this is the, the framework that is going to define the medicine of the future. And uh, uh, basically my uh, goal here today is to share with you, with my colleagues from the panel and with the audience of Biotech Atelier, a few thoughts about where we are, and I think also very important where we are going to. So uh, I want to, uh, you know, to structure my my wrong four ideas. The first one is the concept of personalized medicine. And I realize that personalized medicine has been a, a concept that emerged uh, from the knowledge of gene of ge genomic medicine. Um, from the amazing uh, findings uh, in the field of genetics and in particular sequencing the human genome. So uh, uh, it's important that when we look for the progress of personal, personalized medicine, we do not confuse the concept of genomic medicine with personalized medicine. And actually in the last few years, there have been uh, enormous advances in the field of personalized medicine concentrated on two disease domains, basically cancer and rare diseases. And I think the reason for that is because these diseases are indeed genomic disorders, basically. So uh, a deep understanding of the genomic background uh, in cancer and rare diseases has helped us a lot in the progress of this personalized medicine approach. But at this moment of transition uh, to the future, we have to really uh, leap to take a leap and understanding that if we want to uh, bring personalized medicine to the field of cardiovascular diseases, nutrition, uh, psychiatric disorders, and so on. We need to generate more scientific evidence about the deep biological characteristics of the individual. And this is not only a genomic signature, because the genome is the label with which we are born. But during our life, we accumulate um, a number of events that define who we are from a biological perspective. And it is uh, absolutely important biological understanding 
of who we are from an individual perspective. Uh, this means that we'll have to uh, generate evidence uh, on the knowledge of the proteomic characteristics of uh, our cells, understanding the re transcriptional regulation, uh, generating evidence about how we behave from a metabolic and in this moment of uh, rich activity of the um, research and in the domain where lots of things are happening from a technological perspective, it's important from the perspective of uh, personalized medicine that we create a real single signature that represents the individual uh, characteristics of a particular person, making true the statement that one size does not fit all. This is a very important concept. So the first challenge that uh, I think we are going to face in the next few years is uh, to, you know, to progress in the way we create evidence, uh, um, exploring other uh, scientific domains to be able to bring personalized medicine to a broader perspective of you. The second element that I wanted to share with you is that I think that paradoxically, we have a proof of concept of the importance of personalized medicine these days. And the perfect example is COVID-19. COVID-19 uh, and the pandemic provoked by this virus is a wonderful example of the fact that one size does not fit all. The big question here is why year old person suffering from a chronic cardiac and pulmonary condition when it's infected do not show any symptom and why a 25 year old male or female uh, well nourished sportsman or sportswoman when he or she gets infected develops this terrible cytokine cascade goes to intensive care and eventually dies and this has to do with the individual characteristics of a 95 the individual biological characteristics of the 25 year old. And now there is a strong evidence supporting the fact that the individual immunoprofiling signatures and how the development of the immunological memory and the characteristics of the immune system of these individuals that define them from an immunological perspective had a strong role in the disease developed. So this is a critical uh, element. This is the most personalized medicine community to go deeper in generating evidence that will provide individual biomarkers that will be able to uh, serve us as predictors for development of disease. Third element that I want to share with you is the, the role of the patients. Uh, personalized medicine by itself, uh, the concept of personalized medicine orbitates around the patient and generates a framework where the patient represents the center of the entire domain. Uh, I think this is essential from not only from an ethical perspective, but also from the generation of evidence perspective. Um, when we have the patients on board, the quality of the evidence that is generated is much better than if the patient community is kept apart from the uh, process of understanding a particular a particular disease, and I would like also to 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 you know to to make a little you know to express a little concern that I think we we have to be we have to be brave and really when we say putting the patient in the center, it doesn't have to be like a, a box that we have to tick or kind of a window dressing um, action. The patient has to be really at the center, at the center of the dialogue in a process of co-creation of the process by which we are going to analyze the particular disorders and we, and we are going to try to develop the solutions. Also, this is important from a global perspective because uh, if our aim is to make sure that uh, personalized medicine is widely adopted by the policymakers and the healthcare system, we will never be able to do that without the complicity and the cooperation of the patient community. So it's important that this concept of putting the patient at the center becomes real, becomes brave, and we as scientists and, a generate, and, and, and as people that represent the academia 
uh, mm, responsible for the process of patients. We uh, approach to the patient community. Uh, we take their hands, we bring them on board, and we uh, work together in this uh, in this journey. And I have to say here that I think Bulgaria can provide a really important added value because the Bulgaria uh, strategy for personalized medicine has this special flavor uh, of putting the patient at the center that other uh, national strategies do not have. So for you, um, members of the Bulgarian community, use this because you can really provide added value to the global agenda. And the fourth element, the last one I want to is the creating this transdisciplinary collaboration between these apparently two separated words that are academia and Italy, without a real uh, marriage between these two uh, universes, the progress of personalized medicine, the real progress will never exist. So I think uh, 2021 is going to represent a very exciting year for many, many years. Uh, we have many challenges that probably my colleagues will discuss, the access to gen genomic data, digital health and interoperability of the systems. But I want to, 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 I want to share with you this message, this positive message, that the change is possible because we have now the understanding, the capacities, and it's just a matter of really deciding this journey together. Uh, these are the ideas that I wanted to share with, um, with our colleagues and with the audience. Thank you, Tony. Great opening of the session. And thank you also to be with us. I know that uh, Eatris is evolved today in a, also in a RI days. I have seen the invitation, but you are with us. This is a compliment. Now it's my pleasure to pass the word to Jay, who will um, make a short presentation. Uh, Jay, Professor Shin, is an expert in clinical pharmacology, but also in personalized medicine. Uh, he's a personal friend of mine. I know him for years already. And Jay, now the floor is yours. Please go ahead. I believe you're muted, Dr. Shin. Veronica, you have to unmute him. Yes. Okay. That's good. So, okay. Uh, uh, the, uh, okay. Uh, before I leave my year, you know, I'm sorry to be uh, invited in this, you know, the um, simple uh, In this, you know, I take at the year. Although I cannot be in the, you know, Bulgaria. Um, you know, I really wish to be there, but you know, someday, and after you know, the COVID nineteen is going to be uh, So this uh, the interesting meeting. I wanted to talk uh, about some this specific uh, issue to solve. You know, the um, clinical implementation of the pharmacogenomic into uh, clinical practice, especially in medicine or in housing. So uh, as you all of you agree, you know, precision medicine is real, you know, dream. Um, of the, uh, our, you know, the um, patients, also the uh, patient really wanted to have this in the end. As you know, the, although we have a taking the same the medicine, not all patients having the, the same response. So someone uh, having a failing uh, therapeutic response, some may have, uh, you know, serious toxicity from the same dose regimen, but most of them we have a uh, so we wanted to know who will just have such, you know, the, uh, different outcome. So uh, in order to us uh, to predict, so we need something, the biomark. So in addition to the, our, you know, all the clinical uh, biomark, now we having uh, additional genetic or non-genetic biomark. So through the, you know, the integration of those biomark, we wanted to, uh, to you know, predict the, uh, the clinical response of the uh, medication. Uh, this is a scheme of, you know, the pressure medicine in fact. First to have this, we ha have long been involved in the translation research uh, from discovery to clinical implementation of the uh, biomark in relation to the drug response, the name of the pharmacogenomic. From 
um, the, the discovery to preclinical validation, clinical validation, the health survey, and the also patient outcome. For those three trials of uh, drug late response efficacy, safety, and ADMI. We're using a lot of the technology platform. So, but always, you know, at the moment, we are having a lot of the, you know, the barriers or having need a lot of, you know, the effort to having a clinical utility validation as well as, you know, in, in, into the clinical practice. So this is still, we need a lot of the scientific and the non-scientific, uh, you know, the uh, work. In this era, we do, you know, we just saying, I kind of information I say, okay, personal medicine through pharmacogenetics is now reality in the practice. So we say, also many uh, public, even they know, uh, 20 years ago, you know, the, we, we just only know that in the 20, 21st century will be era of uh, personal medicine, depth work. But, uh, you know, uh, 70 years late, uh, late uh, the Wall Street Journal, they say, with the title of the your medicine, right for your drug metabolism. So, probably uh, understand drug metabolism influence on the, you know, drug response in the given individual patient. Genetics, we, we are just considering to uh, uh, the, you know, the, uh, the personal medicine. So, however, but uh, at the moment, still we have a lot of barriers in the routine clinical practice, uh, clinical implementation of pharmacogenomics for uh, personalized personal medicine. Uh, this is a review article uh, we just published in the years ago. There are a lot of the barriers, scientific barriers still we have. We need more evidence, more document, but more serious is you know, the education of the patients who are the prescribing the genetic service in clinical practice. Even uh, we pharmacogenetic interpretation is always an issue to give the you know the, the routine genotype in the in the field. As well, uh, ethical, legal, social issue and the regulation we need to just consider for the you know the uh, uh, clinical practice and also reimbursement is always a big issue. And the, the, there are country you know difference in the you know the, uh, acceptance of the, uh, the insurance coverage. For the, uh, the genotype service, and uh, um, fortunately in Korean uh, situation, we national government issues is cap for the genotype service for some uh, genes as well as the somatic uh, genetic variant for the you know, uh, cancer chemotherapy. Uh, also, we need uh, you know, good you know the information technology, especially you know we need to put just in the, uh, the clinical decision support systems. Uh, that is a very uh, need for us to you know the user friendly or clinician friendly uh, you know the approach you know, genotype uh, based approach. Uh, the, uh, so if you just make the summary, you know the for the uh, the condition to be implemented successfully uh, to clinic routine clinical practice of the genotype guided personalized uh, medicine or personalized pharmacotherapy. Among them. I wanted to give, just emphasize and how it is uh, difficult to interpret uh, the genotype report, genotype result. So, uh, just to give the example of the my genotype, you can see here. I don't know the, how many audiences can understand what does this mean. Uh, so, this is really, really, you know, the, uh, difficult to understand what does it mean. It's like the code red. People just, just give this information, genotype information, to the, our clinician colleague, how can you use this one uh, for the prediction of the precision medicine or personal dosing? So this is uh, not easy. So therefore, we need something, the solution. Nowadays, the, there are guidelines. So to just, you know, to, uh, use this in you know, genotype. So therefore, uh, there are a lot of the guidelines, among them CP guidelines, you can see here, uh, from the clinical relevance for the genotype, just to give something the sentence of the therapy recommendation, what you have to do. Or another one, but this is really descriptive. Okay, for given genotype. So what is the action we have to do? So therefore, at the moment we have the all you know the guideline having this descriptive approach. So therefore, the many of the uh, the hospitals or uh, you know the, uh, the genotype service company they do just provide a report like this. This, you know, descriptive one, 
or some table style, or maybe something give some different color, or maybe some uh, uh, explanation of what it is, how we can do. So this is our words in Korea. But still, uh, that is not good enough for the teachers to, you know, accept because this, you know, the one page, two page, three page, you know, report, you know, the patients and not easy to just uh, review all those, but cannot just figure out everything to give the, you know, simple you know, the, uh, the decision making. So the best communication with the, our, you know, the, our clinician colleagues must be like this. So far, so large, one topic, the idea, pure. This is, you know, well known just a message to our you know, colleagues. With using whatever the EMR system, whatever connected to, uh, this is really I know expected you know the future of the you know operational medicine recommendation based on the genotypes or pharmacogenetic studies or genomics medicine, whatever. But what about the you know personalized precision uh, pharmacotherapy? This is not just come only from the genotype information. Genotype is not the only factor to influence the drug response. Therefore. You should just consider other factors like the biological factor, environmental factor, or cultural factor, which all of which just influence on the drug response of the individual patient. So, therefore, precision dosing, we should consider all those uh, patient factors to known to all the drug disposition and all response. So, through this, we can do provide the individualized drug treatment regimen. We should consider all those together. So, with using genetics and or clinical coverage together, how we can do use? So there is a two potential model based in you know, approach. As you know, the, whenever you do have something, the, uh, the dose regimen prediction, we do use the, you know, the, uh, the data come from the clinical trials in the drug development or you know, post marketing clinical studies. Through this, you know, in the different uh, coverage, using the specific in specific sub, uh, subset population, what what how we can do adjust the dose regimen? Only based on the one or two just coverage, that's just is the determinant to just you know uh, uh, predict the dose regimen, uh, adjust the dose regimen in the given subset population. But if you just make the one just you know the uh, algorithm to predict. We use those, you know, the all together. We can use two approach, two model approach. One is uh, population PK or population PK PD modeling. That just the data come from the clinical trial. The another one is we can do use uh, visually based PK PD modeling using the mechanistic in vitro to in vivo extrapolation. This I just you know give the um, explanation with using the example. So one uh, part PK. Population PK is just using the data come from the clinical trial or clinical studies. In our cases, we have something isolated. We are doing developing some this you know, model in the many TB drugs. Isolated, we can use the genotype of the NIST transpress. If you use those, you know, the uh, al uh, algorithm, uh, you know, the uh, PAPK model, uh, we are using the NAT to genotype. Uh, that just you can see here, right side. Having much better you know, performance, predictable performance compared to the conventional approach. Or maybe we can do use another, you know, the population PK model for the different genotype. We can do use, predict clearance change according to the GI genotype. And also, we can do even, you know, uh, predict the starting dose of the Tamoxifen. Uh, 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 Taclorimus, uh, with using the uh, chip 3 5 genotype uh, together with some other you know, the clinical information. So, therefore, this is a PAPPK you know, approach. But in the case of PAPPK, we, we can do just develop this if we have the clinical trial data or the data come from clinical study. But if it is not available to conduct the clinical trial study or trial in depth step, uh, subject uh, uh, population, the, especially in the patient who have the little genetic parents, in little genetic parents, we cannot do clinical trial in those patients. Okay. So let me uh, give the example. This is the. Uh, Jay, uh, we are, uh, you are sorry. almost running out of your time. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Let's give the example. This is a little genotype. So, in, and uh, we have this in you know, the clinical data, but, uh, you know, the heterozygous we have, but the homozygous don't have. 
So in this case, we PPK modeling give something solution. You can see the in other heterogeneous experience we get available. But the impatient, we although we don't have the clinical trial, you tend to see predict this you know the change. Or in the clinical setting, as you know, many of genetic parents together in the something combined situation, old age, and then have a dysfunction, we can do. Also, we can do make this one. Make this one with using the PPK modeling. Some we do we expect what is going to happen in this patient. The, that kind of PK change. We can do predict, you know, the individual dose regimen. Um, so I'll just you know add you know, two more slides. You know, in addition to this kind of model, which you can do develop another algorithm. This is a very well known classical algorithm, a multiple linear regression or linear regression. We can do predict the working dose working, and also you know as you all agree that's you know the uh, machine learning approach will be another you know solution to make uh, you know predict the algorithm with using real world data like this, and uh, I do not want to say more, but uh, I, uh, if you just make a summary, pharmacogenotype guide is already available in the clinical practice. However, interpretation and prediction of personal dose regimen is a big issue to solve uh, for the routine clinical practice. Maybe model-informed approach can be one alternative solution to just give the precision dosing in this case, although we need elevation and more experience in the future. To be implemented in the routine practice as a tool for uh, personalized precision prescription. Uh, this is my all just you know, message I wanted to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. This was an uh, excellent insight into pharmacogenetics and uh, precising the dosing and treatment of patients. Dario, now it's your turn. Dario Pritchard is um, the senior vice president of the Personalized Medicine Coalition, probably the most effective uh, personalized or precision medicine society in the world. Um, he is a master in PhD in genetics. Uh, Dario, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dimitar. And I want to first thank uh, again you, Dimitar, and everybody at the Biotech Atelier for inviting me to join you today. I, as Dr. Shin said, wish I could uh, take, visit Sophie and be there in person, but uh, as uh, Tony mentioned, not uh, not this year due to, to COVID. Um, but thank you very much for the opportunity to be part of this. It's just fantastic. I, it's early in the morning here uh, in Washington, D.C., and here I am uh, on a conversation with people from Bulgaria, Spain, and Korea. It's a, it is a terrific opportunity, and I really appreciate being here. Uh, as Dimitar had mentioned, I'm with the Personalized Medicine Coalition, and just a little bit of background on what the PMC is. We're an education and advocacy organization based in Washington, D.C. in the United States, where what we are trying to do, our primary mission, is to advance personalized medicine by clearing the way for policy and clinical adoption of personalized medicine strategies. Um, part of our charge is to develop the evidence and to examine the trends in personalized medicine to help make the case to healthcare decision makers on how to move forward. Now, the Personalized Medicine Coalition has been in existence since shortly after the completion of the Human Genome Project in 2003. I think. Um, the inception of the organization was in 2004, so 16 years in, um, we've noticed that there's a, a been a shift in the last four or five years in where we're focusing our attentions. At, at first, uh, the, uh, the, the primary messaging and the focus of the personalized medicine community towards healthcare decision makers, payers, providers, policymakers, uh, was to make the case for personalized medicine. But over the last four to five years, there's been a significant shift, and now we're focused more on the implementation of personalized medicine strategies. So the question has gone from a discussion of why, why should we move towards a personalized medicine healthcare situation and paradigm to how? How do we do it? And that's where we are now. Now, if we look at the research, I'm gonna provide a, a background of 
of where the trends have been over this course of this 14 years and, and especially over the last four or five years. We look at the research community. Dr. Shin just uh, described some uh, advancements in pharmacogenomics and other scientific areas. Uh, I'll focus on cancer. Uh, cancer clinical trials that involve biomarkers in the clinical trial design has shifted from about 15% of cancer trials that had biomarkers involved uh, in 2000, the year 2000, to about 61% in 2019. The PNC commissioned a study with LEK consulting to examine clinical trials uh, in globally and have come up with these numbers. We look at molecular testing, about 75,000 genetic tests are now available on the U.S. market. If we focus on targeted therapies, uh, we see that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approvals uh, have shown that there were about five personalized medicines available in 2005. And we judge a personalized medicine as a drug that has a biomarker included in its label for either requirement or informative purposes for its use. So there were about five personalized medicines in the year 2005 to about two, over 250 today. This includes 20 new personalized medicines that were approved in 2018. That represented 42%. 42% of all new drug applications. And there were 11 new personalized medicines approved in 2019. Couple this with all of the new pharmacogenomic clinical guidelines that, uh, in, that include biomarkers to help guide their use. And there are over 250 uh, drugs available, personalized medicines available today. Looking at cell-based and gene therapy, the first cell-based therapy was approved in the European Union in 2012 for lipoprotein lipase deficiency. But since, there have been 10 newly approved cell-based and gene therapies in the United States and Europe. Uh, clearly, the scientific research is translating into new technologies that are available for use, personalized medicine. Now, the scientific challenges are uh, ongoing, uh, and they remain, as Dr. Shin just pointed out. But I think the most pressing challenges now are those that involve public policy and clinical adoption. And this is exemplified in the COVID-19 pandemic, as Tony had mentioned, um, where a better understanding of heterogeneity and severity of disease and treatment effects would allow for more effective treatment and population health. We need to provide much better access to diagnostic testing and promote research and data management to identify high-risk populations to have an appropriate public health response to this crisis. Unfortunately, I, I don't mean to digress, but unfortunately, a grim political divide in the United States is hampering sensible diagnostic policy. And our hope is that we can learn from this and move forward more appropriately. But this policy issue and clinical adoption issue goes beyond just COVID-19. We need clinical processes and health policies that support personalized medicine and can accommodate value-based care rather than volume-based clinical care. The key thing, then, there are myriad challenges. Uh, Dr. Andrew mentioned a few, uh, interoperability, data sharing, uh, clinical decision support, uh, regulatory challenges, and certainly reimbursement challenges. But the key thing slowing the adoption of favorable personalized medicine policies is the need for the generation of evidence that it improves clinical care and brings greater value to health systems. Now, personalized medicine, these are relatively new technologies, and there is a need to build the evidence of their value. Now, the evidence that the policymakers, the healthcare decision makers are focused on is real world evidence, practice-based evidence. So that evidence that this works in real practice, not just from clinical trials, but again, since the technologies are new, Data of this kind is usually sparse. 
a new technology where we only have experience of its use over months or a few years, it's difficult to generate the real world evidence of long term effects, both clinical and economic that is needed. Thus, we have a chicken and an egg conundrum, which comes first. We can't use or provide access to these technologies in clinical practice without the evidence that they bring value. But we can't get that evidence that they bring value without using this technologies in clinical practice. And this is the primary challenge we now face in advancing personalized medicine. And we can discuss in the question and answer session and in our discussion on strategies to try to develop that evidence. Now, finally, to wrap up my comments, uh, Dimitar asked for a projection over what uh, personalized medicine has in store over the next three to five years. So my primary thought here goes back to Dr. Andrew's comments. If we learn the lessons from COVID-19 and the coronavirus, we should more quickly develop and implement policies for improved access to diagnostic testing. This is an if, but with what is happening in the world, I expect that we will have within the next five years a greater respect for diagnostics in all clinical areas. And I envision that this will help advance personalized medicine tremendously. For example, in cancer, I think we will develop policies both in the United States and globally for reflex genomic testing for certain cancers and greater access to standard testing in others that will drive an increase in personalized medicine implementation and make it the recognized standard in care. We will see. We will see. So I'll end my comments there. Thank you very much. I am expecting a really very interesting discussion. Now we will see, Veronica, please, the presentation of Dr. Dudov. Welcome to the Transforming Healthcare Topic. Uh, the personalized medicine is evolving very fast, and during the following 10 minutes, I would like to guide you in that new era of data and analytics. Uh, now we have enabling techniques for amplify scientific advances and redefine personalized healthcare, progressing from treatment for segments of patients to truly individualized therapies. Uh, we are on the edge of the biggest shift in healthcare that we have ever known, uh, one that has the potential to give, a, uh, to give each and every patient the best possible care. The shift will transform all aspects of our work, our industry, and healthcare as a whole. This blurry image represents the past one hour view of each patient and their journey was not as clear as it could be. We have made good progress in personalized healthcare to data despite the limited amount of data. Uh, imagine the progress we could make if we had much greater, deeper understanding of patients and their disease. The key to unlocking this transformation, a new wave of data, vast unprecedented amounts of data from multiple new sources. Uh, data is both deep from higher resolution tools and linked to outcomes over time longitudinal. Uh, we have always used data to inform our work, but there is no comparison to the data we have today with what we had in the past. The result is a much clearer, sharper view of each patient, their disease and their journey with the disease over time, like moving from a grainy image to a super high resolution photography. With resolution, we can see the understanding each patient more clearly than ever. The ability uh, to offer precise care uh, that is right uh, for the particular patient, giving them to the best possible chance of good outcomes. It makes a new era of personalized healthcare. In addition, we have this type of picture for many 
many more patients than we ever did before. When we combine the quality and amount of data per patient with the number of patients covered, we have a body of knowledge that is uh, incredibly powerful. Uh, we call this meaningful data at scale, NDAS. Uh, we are very intentional about the use of term meaning data instead of big data. We are led by the science. We access uh, data that will answer specific questions that we have identified as, as most important to our work and patients. Knowing these key questions allows to ensure the databases, uh, data set, sorry, uh, have the right data elements, the deep and breadth quality. At scale, means appropriate scale where the data goes across patient populations to allow for generalizable uh, insights. This is just the beginning. Over the time, both of type of the amount of data will continue to evolve. Already moved uh, on from the days where we release the clinical uh, trial data, which covers only 4% of patients treated. Clinical trials, trials have been considered the gold standard when it comes to evidence generation, but they also have shortcomings. Uh, today, aggregated data from both trials and registered and registries uh, could unlock the patients of real-world data. Uh, for example, as we drive toward uh, more comprehensive genomic profiling in the standard of care, we will be able to enrich our data uh, further and importantly, we will be able to link the various types of data and integrate them uh, with outcomes data. All ecosystem participants are uh, keen to explore the opportunities that uh, meaningful data and scale and an analytics could provide the patient communities, the physicians, the healthcare systems, the regulators, and the payers. Roche is deeply committed to fast forwarding to a future state where data and analytics are transforming healthcare for these and all stakeholders. The vision, the vision for uh, THC is a self reinforcing aging. Uh, or a virtuous circle that starts and ends with a patient. For uh, new many uh, stratified patients to enter clinical practice, we will need broad de deployment uh, of the tools for profiling patients, associated clinical decision support, uh, the therapies that match the stratification and the payer, regulatory, the policy maker support, which enable the change to clinical practice. Uh, if the upgrade uh, is only for data and analytics alone, the rest of the system will lag behind and take a very long time to catch up. The entire infrastructure should be in place so the environment is ready to embrace THC. Uh, it won't be easy. Uh, the calls for a bold, holistic approach addressing both uh, the internal and external systems. A careful balance is required to all ecosystem partners and work in close collaboration across boundaries. The benefits across all, all aspects uh, of the work could already be seen. For example, by using uh, fatty wrong data, the medicines and brought to patient earlier compared uh, to we had run a traditional control arm. Data are also used to inform selection for clinical trials and increase the probability of success. The transformative effects of 
diffusing insights from meaningful data and scale will lift our entire value chain. We will see benefits across the entire healthcare ecosystem, changes that are urgently needed. We all need to uh, ready ourselves for a future where the concept of care is very different uh, to what we know today. With the product of the future, patients will be uh, identified for their therapy with comprehensive genomic profiling. It will be measured against real-world data and points. It might come with a companion app. Uh, it will be practiced according to patient and system outcome, outcomes, but uh, volume, uh, no volume of drug. Uh, and it will uh, combine with clinical decision support as a healthcare solution. We believe this future is one where every patient will have the best possible support for their journey. For each of us means a future where we may better understand our own health, making treatment decisions based on, a, on what has and has not worked for others like us, comparing genetic profiles, uh, health histories and lifestyles, and then tracking our response to, to the treatment in real time uh, so that adjustment can be made quickly along the way. Making this real is quickly, as quick as possible while ensuring a thoughtful long-term approach. We want to make a difference in the lives of patients. This will allow us to do so like never before. But now we have enough time for a good discussion and uh, being one of the organizers, I will hijack with pleasure five minutes from the uh, um, break in order to have a better discussion and a longer discussion. So I will start with the first question, um, which was partially touched by Tony in his presentation. Uh, you told correctly that personalized medicine now is almost only oncology and rare diseases. But my question would be for you and also for the other distinguished panelists, which is the next medical dis discipline where you think that personalized medicine will be impactful? Tony? Well, right now should be infectious diseases, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I, I think it's very interesting because I think infectious diseases um, is the typical paradigm where personalized medicine has, uh, has really add, uh, has the possibility of adding, of adding value because the the uh, individual signatures of patients as infectious diseases are really personalized, are really different and require uh, different biomarkers. But I, I think that in, 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 in holistic terms, uh, probably the big challenge that we have is the big, uh, the big uh, field of neurodegenerative diseases. And here uh, we have to be humble, we have to acknowledge that uh, our understanding of the biology of the nervous system is still limited. Promises that uh, were put on the table around the brain project um, have not been as successful as we expected. So this is a challenge uh, where the entire society should embark. No question about it. Thank you. Jay, you are running a center for personalized medicine in tuberculosis. What do you think about uh, the personaliz personalization of treatments there? Vero, you have to unmute him. Um, oh, okay. Yes, now you are yeah, okay. okay. Uh, that's a really good question. You know, uh, I like Tony and you know, uh, the Andrew, uh, the lady touched in infectious disease. Really, um, a post, you know, uh, interesting. You know, the uh, uh, for us to do um, personalized medicine, and uh, not just the only just considering for the you know embedded issues, but also in the host factor. Uh, we can do use a lot of you know, the biomarker, not only in the genomics biomarker. Here in the in the, uh, the pharmacotherapy, we can do consider you know the um, monitoring of the drug concentration, uh, like the you know drug uh, therapeutic drug monitoring. GDM uh, is really working because you know concentration response is much better 
you know, to help something predict compared to the other, you know, disease or other, you know, the, the therapeutic classes. So therefore, uh, we are just, you know, uh, having an uh, approach to, you know, the use, you know, uh, the different biomarker, uh, the, the PK biomarkers and the, or the PK biomarkers, not only for this one, uh, from the, you know, the, the uh, clinical study, we just getting a TDM collection of all those. And also, you know, the input data to predict, you know, the clinical situation, everyone's working for the you know, PPT modeling. But all those, you know, biomark is really good in, in the infectious disease, not only, you know, tip tuberculosis. And uh, also, you know, we tend to just use, you know, the uh, biomark. Uh, uh, that biomark is, uh, uh, the, you know, biomark uh, predicts, uh, they reflect something the invaders. So we are just considering the transcriptomics, you know, the genomics uh, of the, you know, invaders, as well as host genomics or, you know, uh, or metabolomics. Uh, all those, you know, the biomark could be something formulated, you know, to uh, predict the response. So therefore, uh, integrating all those, you know, the uh, biomarkers uh, could just make the model to just predict response outcome in a given patient. That could be kind of the, you know, the, uh, the decision tree or uh, kind of the, you know, the, um, the optimum dose prediction. Uh, so all those, you know, integration may make something good outcome. Although we are just, you know, starting period, but in the years later, we can do make at least in some solution. Uh, yes. So this is, uh, I think, yes, and uh, this in the infection is really uh, good, you could to just use, you know, the dog, those kind of old IBUS, uh, biomarker, or, you know, uh, as, you know, the uh, um, medicine. Thank you very much. Dario, before passing the word to you, I just want to tell you that within one session, I have a very interesting panel on personalized psychiatry. So when I graduated medicine, I had two options. Uh, the one option was obstetrics and gynecology. It was, this was my family destiny because my father was a gynecologist on. And the other option was psychiatry. But I said, no, no psychiatry because they don't use lab. They just talk with the people and that's it. So what do you think about psychiatry? Do you think that they will be also in the game with personalized medicine? That's an excellent point to bring up. And I'll uh, back up just a little bit to uh, Dr. Shin's presentation. You know, we think of personalized medicine in oncology and in rare and undiagnosed disease inherited disorders, but the other third primary area is pharmacogenomics, and that is having a great impact on the field of psychiatry and behavioral medicine and neurobiology. Uh, I think many of the uh, CPIC guideline drugs have drug gene interactions that involve psychiatric drugs. And uh, in, in many cases, we're approaching the same set of challenges. How do we provide access to that testing so that we can provide the appropriate dosing and try to get away from ineffective treatments for many of these patients? Um, and we're seeing, we're having a, a regulatory debate in the United States about that issue right now. But I think that is, maybe the most um, uh, exciting area in personalized medicine right now is, is pharmacogenomics and psychiatry. I'll also point out that the pharmacogenomics are very important, obviously cardiovascular disease, uh, but also autoimmune disease and now infectious disease. So this is, um, uh, this is where the field is moving uh, of biomedicine in general. Oncology has been a good launch off point, but we're seeing it in all other disciplines as well. Dimitar, if I uh, can, I add one comment to what uh, that absolutely you can do if you want. I, I I think it's very interesting the comment that he made about psychiatric disorders, and and I think uh, it's it's good to know that uh, the European Commission, in the process of preparing the next uh, work program for the first year of Horizon Europe, is uh, considering the possibility of launching a topic in the next uh, work program uh, for identify stratify biomarkers for mental disorders. So I think it's great because, Daryl, that means that the policymakers on the European side, following the same, you know, discussion that you're having on the American side, finally realize that it's also the moment for personalized medicine for psychiatric disorders. So I, I think uh, I, I think there is a big challenge here, enormous challenge, because this is going to require a, a, a really strong multidisciplinarity of the team presenting these proposals. Uh, but it's good to know that it's uh, a pathway there that uh, 
probably uh, will be very successful. Great input, Tony. Thank you very much. Um, all the four presentations had also uh, shed light on data. Dario, I will start this time with you. You mentioned that in the United States you have 75,000 genetic tests, different genetic tests which are offered. And every genetic test is generating data. What guys do you do with all the data which you generate with, ge with the genetic testing in the United States? This is a primary challenge. It's uh, sometimes uh, seems like a mountain of data and how do you get to the data that's necessary? A key challenge to this is now how do you bring that, how do you use that data to inform the clinical treatment decision making and how do you deliver that data to the uh, clinician at the point of care in a way that is useful to them, it doesn't become a confusing or distracting uh, situation with too much data that can't be used. How how do we deliver it? And that's where a lot of new companies, new uh, organizations are really focusing their attention on. How do we translate that data, sometimes mountains of data, into clinical decision support that's useful and appropriate for a clinician? The key thing, I think, to that challenge is involving us, as Tony just mentioned, a multi-stakeholder approach involving the clinician, the patient, key, the data supplier, the data processing groups, and the researchers all within the, the, the context of developing the clinical decision support, integrating it directly into the electronic health records, uh, and turning those electronic health records into interoperable records that can be portable, the patient can bring them from doctor to doctor so that they can be used most appropriately. Now, I'm not going to say that we're there yet, but there is a lot of attention on it and a lot of companies that are working on that space. Jay, what do you think about generating data uh, coming out from ge genomic testing? Okay, yeah, that is, you know, the, um, I have the, uh, the just you know, the, uh, the, uh, very agree with you know the um the uh, Dr. Gary, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I we have also you know the uh, the uh, always you know, issues as I just told you know the, uh, the we do just gen uh, generate a lot of data, but the depth data still just you know give some people limited information. As I just told you, just you know descriptive information we can provide at the moment. So therefore, uh, all the issues you know the um, the, uh, although, you know, the, as a, you know, the attached by the, uh, better, you know, the, the many translational, uh, the, um, the, you know, uh, genetic data translational company, uh, the two, you know, the Christians, uh, although they do provide the information, that information still, uh, many information to descript, uh, just the, including the several pages or, you know, the, some, uh, many sentences, it means, uh, uh, I I don't know that you know it depends on the individual you know clinicians in the uh, in the if the clinicians have you know, a lot of knowledge and uh, easy to just understand all those information they can do use for by uh, for their you know clinical decision making. But uh, and the most of the clinicians who are not just you know familiar with those information, I guess that could be something that kind of the uh, I don't know it's just the garbage or you know the uh, there's something uh, spam uh, in in some sense. So therefore. Uh, we just you know each is a data we should in a lot of uh, integrate we should give the much more clear sentence or uh, probably some uh, the uh, sentence to be easy uh, for them to understand or to use uh, uh, to those you know the prescription uh, or which is a make prescriber uh, that is uh, the one issue I guess so uh, there are so many data but uh, all data cannot just you know give a very clear answer to you know given. Uh, Therefore, we have, you know, in the case of Hama Green, there are uh, ICPC consortium. The many uh, experts, we do just have the consortium to make something, uh, some good just decision make us, uh, good recommendation. Uh, but the that recommendation, still, we just give the, uh, we just collect the huge, you know, the information from the, uh, the data available in the literature and the just, you know, the extracted. And then making some put just the one sentence or to to the given situation, but uh, that is you know still uh, just you know the um, 
we need a lot of the harmonization, a lot of the uh, consensus in the uh, in, in the, uh, the giving one uh, sentence to to, uh, to the you know question. That is what I can say. You know, the, uh, at the moment, you know, the, uh, the, the so many data we can just generate uh, a consensus, harmonized uh, uh, just you know the uh, sentence and uh, for us to you know give you know to uh, the our you know, the clinician colleague that's the status. Uh, so uh, I can say yes. You know, the, uh, the, the so many data. Just you know, the, we need a very extracted uh, consensus-based approach to use those. Uh, document the interview you know, take a purpose. Thank you. Tony? Yeah, I think this is, of course, this is one of the big challenges. We have an enormously rich system, but tremendously fragmented. And this is one of the big challenges that we have. And in the data field, I mean, pro having reliable and efficient data sets are, are absolutely necessary for analyzing and generating the evidence that we need for the progress of personalized medicine. But of course, we have problems or challenges at the level of the interoperability of the data set, lack of integration between uh, genomic data and clinical data, uh, cross-border issues for uh, um, the use of the electronic uh, health records. The same problem that there is in the US for the interoperability of electronic health records, we do have uh, in Europe. So this is, and the lack of uh, a common digital health uh, space is creating is creating a real bottleneck for the progress of personal medicine. This is leading to fragmentation. And again, we have a perfect example on COVID-19 because as a result of that, uh, the system is generating uh, absurdly thousands of clinical trials that if we were able to put together, the uh, generation of evidence would be much stronger. Right now, for instance, we have more than 3,000 clinical trials running in the field of uh, COVID-19. Um, for instance, just for the hydroxychloroquine clinical trials, there are actually 170 clinical trials that are still recruiting patients for hydroxychloroquine uh, studies. So this is absurd. And one of the reasons that uh, is leading to this fragmentation is that difficulties in the clinical community and the academic community to have an efficient uh, use of uh, digital data. Thanks. We are out of time, but once again, I would hijack uh, two, three more minutes. Uh, I really would appreciate very short answers, but our biotech atelier was always extremely patient-centered and patient-oriented. Um, do you think that uh, the patients can get more uh, in the development of personalized medicine? Jay, let's start with you, but really only uh, two, three sentences, no more, because we are uh, definitely out of time. Okay. So your question is, uh, you know, the, in the patient. How far the patient can get more involvement in personalized medicine development? That is really also important, you know. Um, yeah, the, at the moment, you know, the, um, if I just introduce a little bit, uh, you know, for example, precision medicine implementation. Uh, uh, in the case, in this case, uh, the you know the clinicians, our clinician colleagues, they, they are not, most of the clinicians that do not do understand you know the, uh, this you know the precision medicine in, in depth. You know, especially the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the patients who are just working in the local uh, clinic. In the case, uh, uh, the, in addition to the you know the understanding of the, this knowledge in, in the clinical side, clinician uh, prescribe. But also, you know, the, uh, we are just really you know, interesting to just educate or uh, the, uh, the our patient for them to understand the what uh, the, you know, the levels of this, you know, the, uh, the pharmacogenic or, or you know, patient medicine for their you know the involvement. This is, a, I guess, you know, the uh, for us to just having uh, just you know the uh, the this you know the patient uh, uh, medicine to be implemented in the practice. I in addition to the understanding of the clinician uh, expertise. Expert also, you know, understanding with the you know the uh, patients. Therefore, we have that uh, depth in the in the flows, you know, communication, uh, education, or you know, the sharing of the information with the our you know the, uh, patients. I guess. Thank you, Tony. Last words. Yeah, patients are essential for changing the mindset on the entire society. They were they are the voice of the personalized medicine in front of the in front of the global global community. 
So they, they need to, to, to be inside, they need to be with us in order to deliver the right messages to the, to the society and then can provide uh, a perspective of the biology of the disease, which is very, very personal from them. And we can only understand if it comes from their own knowledge. Dario? So, Dimitar, COVID has revealed some, in the United States, some real deep disparities in the delivery of care, uh, really disproportionately affecting, neg severely affecting some racial and ethnic minorities and socioeconomic groups. The, 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 there's, uh, the, the problem stems, as you had mentioned, from the idea that we're not thinking about the diverse population that personalized medicine, the individuals, the diversity in individuals at the research level. The good news is that this pandemic has shined a light on that. And there are a number of new programs to get patients involved at the research level so that we have research about diverse populations within the uh, context of developing new personalized medicine technologies and using them most appropriately. Thank you. Uh, I think that we had a great discussion and a great panel. And Tony, just to tell you at the end, um, I think that what you said, patients are the voice of personalized medicine will be the slogan of the next biotech atelier. I hope you don't expect copyright for this. Guys, thank you for everything. Jay, it's already late uh, in Korea. Thank you for joining and have a nice day. Thank you very much. See you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye now.